Good afternoon and welcome everyone to AMA New York's session on the workplace and its current state. The 20, the state of hiring and marketing trends, insights and advice is our topic for the day. I wanna give a uh, great welcome to our uh, four panelists who will be fielding our conversation today uh, and helping us to uh, obtain more insights and understanding on the state of hiring, job searching, moving through your career and strategically making decisions about growing your uh, professional uh, life, your professional venue, and also uh, hiring into an, and building your organization into being a stronger marketing uh, team. Uh, but first, let me talk a little bit about AMA New York. Uh, I'm Lori Johnson. I am uh, AMA New York's uh, president-elect and involved in uh, both the local uh, New York uh, metropolitan area activities for AMA New York and national. Our vision is to inspire, support, and celebrate brilliance in marketing, and we hope that we do that effectively today. Uh, we know that marketing is really rap rapidly growing and changing and evolving. Uh, we are in more parts of the business than ever before, not just revenue, product development, audience development, market, target marketing, um, target new uh, audiences, and we're being challenged uh, in accord with that growth like ever before. Um, our ability to pivot, to make quick decisions, and to really understand the marketplace and the effects on profitability are extremely important. The pandemic, emergence of new platforms like uh, TikTok and uh, even AI's explosion into chat, uh, GBT, it's, there's constantly new concepts and new ideas and technology being thrown at us. Along with the wave of um, tech lay layoffs and what, all the things going on in the financial sector, um, every Monday is a new is a new the start of a new game. So we're at a point where marketers really need to develop and focus on many different customer touch points, different skills, different uh, inform inf information, and um, be able to uh, wear many different hats. Skills, t tools, teams, stakeholders, partners um, are all very important. So what are the expectations with regard to us, our roles as marketers? Uh, our own growth from a career perspective, uh, the timeliness of moving through to next levels in our career, uh, finding that perfect fit for us, and also contributing to the organization in a way where we are seen as the value drivers that we are. How can we help that? So our goal today is really to update you at the attendees on the state of the recruitment industry, marketing, Hire, hiring uh, senior marketers and really how we can leverage and manage that to the to the greatest degree. Uh, before before we start our discussion, I'd like to introduce our panelists and, and thank them all again today for making time and joining us. First, we have uh, Jennifer Doge. She's a co-lead marketing and customer active activation and growth practices at Russell Reynolds. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks, Lori. Then we have Richard Sanderson, marketing communications and sales practice leader at Spencer Stewart. Thank Welcome, you, Laurie. Richard. Thank you for your time today. Cool. Anastasia Williams, the founder and CEO of The A-List. Wonderful to Hi. see you, Anastasia. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and Larry Brantley, the president of uh, Challenger, which is a um, very well-known recruitment organization that's um, just published um, some uh, research on the state of hiring, and you'll talk a little bit about that in our discussion today. Uh, Thanks, so, Larry. Welcome, welcome, Larry. So uh, let's start our, our conversation today. Um, before we do, though, a few, uh, few things. If you've got, we'll have to a Q and A session at the very end of everyone's comments and the uh, conversation today. So if you've got specific questions that you'd like to potentially be fielded by our uh, wonderful group of panelists, please enter them in chat. We'll do our best to cover as many. Uh, questions at least categorically as we can at the end. Um, and if we've got many left over, we'll certainly um, set up a channel where you can get direct answers to your questions if you'd like to specifically uh, ask the question of any individual. So let's start with our the current landscape uh, in marketing. Um, to the panelists, what trends are moving the job market today? I, I know it's a that's a loaded question. There's so many, so many things happening. Like I said, every Monday is different. Um, but um, maybe you'd like to uh, give a start to that. What are the current things that are um, driving the trends in marketing? Uh, 
I'm happy to start. I, I think one of the things that we're seeing at, at Challoner is um, the pace in marketing is moving a little slower. There's a little more purposeful focus uh, because I think uh, business leaders want to make sure their dollars are invested uh, as wise as possible when it's not sure what's around the corner. But the biggest trend that we're seeing is the combo roles. Uh, we're seeing uh, where instead of one title, which might be a brand marketer, we're now seeing uh, where they might be brand and product, or they may be um, a chief communications and marketing officer in organization. So we're seeing where there's a consolidation of the focus um, and the dollars have gone up as well. But I think that's the biggest trend is we're seeing the more effective and targeted use of dollars, but also positions that are com combined as opposed in the past that may have been separate. <clears throat> I'll 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 build on that, Laurie. So a, a few things going on. One is there's actually some, at least to us, there's some conflicting trends going on right now in the employment market. You know, on the one hand, unemployment is at generational lows, and yet I think in certain areas of the market, and Spencer Stewart focuses a little bit on the senior end of the market, there has been a noticeable slowdown in the last six months. So it's always a case of going a little bit below the headlines. And even then, when you look at industry by industry, there's some real noticeable changes going on. For the first time last year, many of the West Coast technology companies announced reductions in force, sometimes the first time they've ever done it. There are hiring freezes in places in some businesses. And yet, if you were to look at the headline numbers that come out of the Department of Labor, you'd think this has never been a better time to have a job. So I think we're seeing some differences between what's happening at the sort of the senior end, and that does impact, of course, chief marketing officers, marketing leaders, versus what's happening in the in the overall uh, labor market. That's not really being spoken about as much, although I think there has been a notable chill in some of the senior level work. It does vary industry by industry. Actually, for us at Spencer Stewart, the consumer retail practice actually is doing is growing double digits, but there are other areas, financial services practice or areas around what we call TMT, technology and media telecom, that's just having a that's just having a harder year of it. Um, I think we might look back at 2021 and 2022 and reflect that perhaps there's been there was a little bit of overhiring that might have taken place in those years, and we're seeing perhaps a reversion back to the mean right now in 2023. Thank you, Richard and Larry, for that uh, information. It's very helpful, especially the view related to different uh, sectors of the industry. Um, what about the state of the workplace? You know, there's been, there was such a huge change in the past three years with regard to uh, workplace uh, norms, uh, remote working and such. Uh, the impact of remote staff hiring, relocation and regional and what we're seeing reflected today. How is that impacting the job search and hiring? Um, I'll, I'll start there, Lori. I think that, um you know, industry role and, and location, all of those things play a factor in, um, you know, a company's decision to offer office only or hybrid or fully remote roles. Um, you know, we're seeing, I think, companies requiring that are requiring more full-time in-office roles or offering different benefits and perks to employ, encourage employees to come back. Um, there are certainly, um, you know, a host of, of companies and industries that are, are leaning more toward people back to office. Um, uh, we did see also uh, McKinsey's done some research recently that showed that those who left the workforce in the early phases of COVID um, flexibility, workforce flexibility has been a top reason that they've accepted mm -hmm. new jobs and come back into roles. Um, so I think that's still very top of mind. Um, you know, we're seeing our clients also that being very aware that, you know, when a candidate's deciding between a particular offer um, or a role that might have similar compensation or similar, a similar mandate, um, that that opportunity to work flexibility uh, can can really become a deciding factor. Mm. Thank I you. Think one thing that each year we just completed a, a pulse survey, and I invite everyone on the call. If you're not already connect with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. You'll be able to get the results of the pulse survey, uh, and I'm sure the other panels will feel the same way. To feel free to reach out to us. But the the trend that I found the most fascinating and our poll survey is is a 48 hour 10 questions multiple choice uh, that breaks down the demographics and the years of experience but also are they looking for work are they working from home uh, are they working remote 
And you'll see in that the series of the last three years. But one thing I found fascinating is before the pandemic, 80% are only working in the office. They did not work uh, from home at all. We're now at 50-50, uh, where 50% of the population work from home, 50% are working in an office. And those that do go to the office are primarily 80% are hybrid. So they're only going in between two to four days a week. They're not going in every day. So I, I found that was really fascinating. And last year's results, we saw that those who did change jobs in the last two years, um, obviously pay was a huge factor. 70% um, uh, last year uh, changed because of pay. That number is still really high. It's close to 75% now. Um, so that there's really an interesting stat. I think the remote employee um, a year ago was significantly higher number. Now we're only seeing employers offering that at 25% of the new jobs are remote. And I will also say, uh, to the point mentioned earlier, we've seen some of the overhiring where they were primarily remote. Those, unfortunately, are the ones that might be impacted first if there is a downsizing or a layoff with those organizations. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I've uh, we've seen uh, with with our members that um, uh, in regards to the sweeping layoffs, that the ones who were uh, were primarily remote um, were the ones that that were hit first and then hybrid and then so and then so forth so uh so i completely agree with larry on that um i would simply add laurie I, I am not seeing a huge amount of consistency in how return to office is being applied i am seeing clients in similar industries that can have radically different policies in terms of return to office and what that means for them and their and their team members for example i'm sitting here in in Chicago, and anyone who's here in Chicago will know that, you know, a very large employer here, Allstate, has sold their head office and it's being demolished as we speak. There, there is no mm -hmm. content or there is no place for their 40 odd thousand employees to go to anymore. I mean, there are going to be hubs around the country, but that sort of concept has gone away. There are other companies within the same industry, and I won't name this one, but are mandating five days back in the office. I mean, they're mm -hmm. theoretically in the same industry, in the same category, selling the same product to the same customers, and they have completely polar opposite approaches to return to office and it's hard to it's hard to define what the through line is between this um somewhat cynically i might say you know go and look and see if the ceo bought a house in florida over the course of the pandemic and that might tell you what the, what the company's general approach is to return to office um but uh, i wouldn't want to say that in a you know too broadly but but i think there is some uh, some potential truth to that I think we're also finding in all the searches that we do, location and relocation in particular is the single thorniest mm -hmm. topic we're dealing with. People just don't want to relocate. And, and I sort of understand it. It's actually very expensive now to relocate. If you're gonna have to go and buy a house, you're looking at a six or 7% mortgage rate. I mean, it's a legitimately now expensive exercise um, to, to relocate and, and, and move your family, if, if that's the case. Nearly every search, there's a deep discussion about location and often some evolution in the approach that our clients are making. I am finding as a result, it's actually taking our searches a lot longer to do because a very conservative mm -hmm. line, the beginning of a search may need to evolve when the reality is that the talent just isn't there in their market or isn't willing to, mm -hmm. to locate, to relocate to it. So it this is a really sticky topic. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. It's wildly inconsistent across across the industry. And I think we're going to keep talking about it for a, for a long time to come. You I think it's Richard definitely a talent. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I think it's definitely a, a talent market in, in regards to talent is driving the, the conversation in regards to even negotiations. We're hearing uh, we're hearing negotiations. If uh, if companies are paying less then they negotiate the, the hybrid and the remote, the remote work part there. Uh, well, talent uh, is more about the work life balance. I think the pandemic may had everybody shifting more towards work-life balance and understanding, you know, looking around and saying, oh, wow, I haven't been here in a while <laughs> at my house, at your house. Um, and, uh, and wanting to, wanting to be more, more outside, I guess, uh, for lack of a better description. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's been, you know, I would agree. I, I agree with both Larry and Richard that it's in certain sectors, it, there, there is uh, a push to go back to the office, but across the board, it is, it is inconsistent because you have, uh, you have talent who just aren't um 
they aren't jumping at the offers anymore. They want to know what the, they want to understand what the full, what the full package is. And, and they even want to throw in stuff that isn't on the list. I think that was true for us a year ago. I don't think it's today. I think today it is, it is definitely from, at least from our perspective with the mid to executive level roles that we place, it is an employer's market. Um, and we are seeing in the poll survey, which again, I will make sure everyone gets to see, we are seeing a return to some relocation just for selective targets. But for instance, we have offices in Texas and New York, and you can't be more opposite. Uh, Texas is like, what pandemic? And New York is saying the sky is continuing to fall. So it's we're seeing most employers uh, are not returning to office in New York, at least some of the, the larger corporations and agencies that we interact with. Um, and they're, they've kind of given up on the brick and mortar to uh, the mention of the Allstate office. I'm seeing that with agencies extremely large. One client that we have this week, I had a conversation, they have five offices with probably nationally close to 100,000 square feet for their staff, and they're getting rid of all of it, all of it. So their staff will be working hybrid or remote or using flex space. So I'm sorry, we probably spent more time on that question, but there's a lot going on in that area for sure. Absolutely. Thank you for the, that um, detailed coverage. I think it's of great interest to everyone um, and certainly a big, a big concern, very interesting. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, DEI as it relates also to uh, trends and hiring and the decisions about uh, that are uh, connected, uh, not just for hiring, but also for accepting positions. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. What's the state of those initiatives and how are they really influencing uh, job placement and selection in marketing? Um, I can start off with that. Um, I know we're getting a lot of requests from various companies uh, just in terms of helping uh, provide uh, provide uh, diverse talent uh, and talent of color, particularly in the senior sectors, uh, senior level sectors. Um, and it you know it's been interesting. Uh, the uh, the the breadth of the areas that that folks want to hire in and the difficulty, the challenges they have, uh, particularly in the finance industry, um, of finding talent of color is uh, has been a challenge. But we've definitely been getting more requests for it. Uh, there seems to be, uh, I would, I don't know that I would say a focus. Um, I, I know there was a huge focus right after the George Floyd uh, and uh, Breonna Taylor murders. Um, I mean, the, I, every five minutes, the, uh, the phone is ringing for diverse talent. Um, I think that that has definitely, uh, it, it steadied for a moment and then it, it has definitely dropped off and lessened uh, in recent months, but it is still a focus. And for those companies that are still focusing on it, thank you very much, appreciate you. Um, uh, but uh, but I will say in terms of the senior level roles, I am getting more requests and we are get, I am seeing more in the market for diverse talent at the executive uh, and senior levels. It's a part of our DNA and has been since we started. So we've always measured on a weekly, monthly and annual basis, the representation of diverse placements. Um, we're big believers in reflecting the community at large and that means diverse staff and talent. It is a request of every client we get. I will say a year ago, we almost went the opposite extreme where there were mandates that only diverse talent could be presented. And we had to push back a little bit on that, that yes, we will always make sure you have a diverse slate, but you know, someone's ethnic background does not make them a better candidate to do the task you need to have done, have done, but we want to make sure that's reflected. I am seeing employers are switching. A year ago, we got a, saw many, many marketing and comms roles that were diversity, equity, inclusion. I don't see that same percentage, but the flip side, which I think is also, I'm curious that everyone else has thought, We've had major talent that when we get there and there was a fear of some diverse talent who are amazing and a great fit for the job that were afraid to take it because the board didn't look like them. And there was mm -hmm. a fear of tokenism. And my comment, who's going to be first? Who's going to step up? Who's going to bring the others behind them? So we found just the opposite of getting someone to convince them of a job because their fear of I get in and it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. 
That's true. I mean, it's it's definitely tough when you don't see it. You know, it used to be that folks uh, didn't mind being ill or didn't, you know, just wanted to get their foot in the door or or were um, were I, I shouldn't say didn't mind because um, I've been the only one and I minded a lot. Um, but uh, um, uh, it's it's not nobody's jumping to be the first anymore. Nobody's running to be to be the first. And uh, and not that anybody did before, but I think there were more people willing to do it. Uh, but you're, you're right. No, people aren't willing to do it anymore. It's, um, it's more about what, what kind of an environment have you created in which I can thrive in? Uh, have you set, you know, and uh, are you, do, is there, are there communities, you know, are, are there ERGs, you know, how, what is, what is happening within the organ within your organization that makes me want to come and be a part of it? Uh, because, you know, it's, um, it's, it's one thing to be, you know, diversity is, 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 it's one thing to be diverse in your, in, in your approach, but you also have to make people feel welcomed. You know, there, there has to be a sense of belonging. And uh, if people don't feel that they're not going to want to be a part of it. If I could just add a couple of points to everything that Anastasia and Larry have said, uh, when we've looked at the marketing leaders, at least of the fortune 500, uh, so obviously the largest companies and the senior chief marketing officer role, I think the comment I would make is there's been a lot of progress, but there's still work to be done. So what mm -hmm. I mean by that is we've essentially reached gender parity now, which is great news in marketing leadership roles. It's about a 50-50 male-female split. But in terms of marketing leaders from historically underrepresented groups, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, when we looked at the Fortune 500, only 14% of chief marketing officers are from historically underrepresented groups that is way behind where the population as a whole is and so even though I feel there's a lot of diverse talent coming in um, into the funnel it's it, it's still taking a while to get into the senior roles and I think there's work that needs to be done maybe it's around Anastasia's point around inclusion around here how do we ensure long-term success uh, of hires in the organization and, and that it builds up over time. And look, this this will take decades to get to the, the top jobs. And don't get me wrong, this is not going to be solved overnight, but there's still a lot of work to be done, but recognizing there has been some progress. Certainly a topic that we could have a, an, an additional hour conversation on and hopefully we will continue <laughs> to drive those conversations uh, in, our, in our daily uh, networks that we, people that we focus on. We know that that's part of what's very important to us here at AMA New York. So thank you for that. Um, so talking a little bit about roles now, roles, talents, skills, um, what are some of the most sought, sought after roles and skills? We touched on it a little bit earlier about you know, the dual role, but specifically capabilities, experience. Talk to us a little bit about what we should uh, focus on and bring uh, to the fore related to our expertise. Yeah, you know, I'll start. I'll start there for a quick second. I think just I, double clicking on the point I think that Larry made in an earlier an earlier question. Um, just the the CMO role and the expectations of the role and the mandate of the role are morphing. And so, no matter where you are, I think in your career, your ability to think about and add to your mandate to expand the things that you're doing, um, I think will only add obviously to your marketability going forward. Um, CMO roles are you know, frankly, morphing into more customer centric and more tech enabled roles, frankly. So if we're thinking about the top of the house, you've got things like Unilever CMO becoming a chief digital and commercial officer instead, right? You've got Under Armour, uh, now a CMO role is being fulfilled by someone with the title of chief consumer officer, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those trends are only continuing and I think moving down into organizations. Um, when you talk, I think there was a, a question earlier about whether or not really companies are looking for brand oriented marketers or performance and growth oriented marketers. And I think the question, frankly, the answer, frankly, is both. I think that, um, you know, for consumer brands, performance marketing and growth marketing and an increased focus on measurement and marketing ROI is really, really important right now. Um, the function needs to have a more modern marketing toolkit and the feedback that we're getting from clients is they want to see candidates with that kind of a toolkit. But functions need balance. And so brand marketers and content leaders and storytellers are still really, really important, right, to a company's success, but you need to be able to measure what you're doing um, and show how, how you're contributing to, to business growth. 
Agreed. A lot of companies are starting to focus on on hire uh, chief customer officers that have never had them before. I think Bath and Body Works just hired a, a brand new chief customer officer. They've never had that ever. So uh, and there and and like you said, Jennifer, the combination of of tasks and roles and duties is um, at the senior levels has become more prevalent just across the board. I think um, you're also. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, it was in, as I think about the pandemic, the start of the pandemic about three years ago now, I think about over that period of time, I've definitely seen waves of different types of roles mm -hmm. uh, be in vogue and then some out. I remember in that, in that immediate post-pandemic trend of 2020, we saw a wave of VP of brand searches. I think the pandemic mm -hmm. actually offered a moment for some businesses to reset and reposition their brand or they needed to respond to changing environments and what their brand stood for in that immediate post-pandemic trend. I remember then in 2021, there seemed to be a wave of, of, of uh, customer experience, chief experience officer type searches that were trying to blend, trying to find that intersection between marketing and technology. There was a new wave, obviously, as, as I think consumers have been leaning into digital. Again, there was another wave of digital orientated, um, digital experience focused trends. There was a lot of search work going on around digital and customer experience. Um, there was briefly, I saw a wave, we had a, a, a series of marketing technology, VPs of MarTech searches. I didn't see nearly as many as I thought we were going to. There were a handful of searches that, that, that we led nearly mostly at the VP um, uh, stage. Uh, and I was actually finding a lot of folks coming actually from agencies, client side, into those uh, VP of marketing technology roles. And then of course, as, as, as everyone said here, there have been this, this wave, and it's not a particularly necessarily a new wave. The chief customer officer is very much in vogue in, in retail in particular, and pretty much most retailers of some scale have attempted or, or now experimented with a chief customer officer role um, of, of some sort. And I think it speaks to the, the increasingly multi-channel complexity, the way consumers now, now choose to shop and engage with, with brands and businesses. I think the key point, I think Jennifer made this, was the real focus on measurable marketing. It's not so much a case of you know pick or choose between performance marketing or brand, but the sense of, particularly in the environment of 2023, what bang am I getting for my buck? You know, what really is the return on marketing investment? And this sense of being able to drive a real measurable marketing mentality across a marketing organization, whether it's on the brand side or the performance side, that's really the the key shift and, and mindset uh, I've seen. I do think marketing budgets are under pressure in 2023 and marketing leaders really have do have to respond and demonstrate they're delivering measurable marketing. I think uh, to add to, to all those great comments, I think it's also, we saw before the pandemic that the, the role of the CMO was short-term at best at many large organizations. And it was the, the moving, uh, follow the bouncing ball, how long will they last? How long will they be able to implement? And I think one of the evolutions, at least from my perspective, of why we have the CCMO or, or CMCO role, however you want to define it, it's actually giving teeth to the roles you can actually execute, not only the brand strategy, but the communication plan, whether it be internal buy-in from your own teams and staff, whatever your industry might be, as well as the external communications and the brand visibility um, from a marketing side. So I think we'll see if this sticks and continues, but there's cost efficiencies, but also the power to really enforce and communicate the brand strategy. Thank you so much for the dive there. Really insightful information. Um, continuing on, on that topic just a little bit more, what about uh, contract, freelance, um, part-time to perm? How is that impacting and affecting um, role demand and testing these new titles? And talk a little bit about how that's working and what you're seeing. From our perspective, we only place direct hire full time, but I've seen the the fractional CMO role continue, where people will hire a consultant to come in before they make the decision on what they want to do. Um, I think at a mid level, brand marketers uh, we're definitely seeing more consultants, and as the market has been unstable, uh, that allows individuals to kind of test the waters before they make that full time commitment. That. That's kind of what we saw in 2008, 2012, same thing. It's 
if it becomes unstable, you find a way to get the work done one way or the other. And for the consultants, they can many times make more money on an hourly or project basis versus direct hire. Uh, but that's just an observation of, of what I see and the people I talk with in the community, not from a, this is what we place, because we still only place the direct hire challenger. I, I'd echo Larry's comments. What has been interesting has been the growth of the fractional CMO industry. Um, I think part of it speaks to just the increasing complexity of the marketing skill set and how so many roles have become really quite specialized over the last few years. I mean, when was the last time you saw your, when did a marketing leader ever take their creative director and put them in the role as head of performance marketing? You just don't see it. And increasingly, there's some very specialized swim lanes that seem to exist now within marketing. By the way, I do think that represents a long-term challenge for development and succession to the marketing leadership role. But I have seen um, fractional marketing leaders really with a very clear, distinct positioning around, you know, it might be performance marketing, acquisition marketing, whatever it may be, and being dropped into, into various roles. There, there definitely has been more of that, and I think as a reflection that marketing is no longer a profession of generalists, but really uh, some very focused specialists instead. Thank you for that. So let's take a dive into, you know, actually landing that role now at all levels, uh, whether they're um, next-gen marketers or very experienced uh, 20 year plus uh, marketers. So we have all of that in our audience today. Um, just in general, how should candidates sort of adjust their job strategy to this new reality? If I've not, you know, been looking for a job for five years, you know, since pre-COVID, what, what's the most important thing I need to do differently? I think it's more about um, networking. I, and I, you know, and, and I, it's not even about networking because, you know, everybody can do a grip and grin and anybody can meet anybody uh, anywhere. I think it's more about building social capital. You, you, uh, the networks that you, that you already have, understanding and realizing who is in your, your network um, and, and reaching out, uh, being brave enough and feeling vulnerable and, you know, to feel vulnerable, to, um, to show your vulnerability and, and reach out to the people who are already in your network even if it's former bosses who are working elsewhere now, um, uh, you know, and you can find it anywhere. You can find it in, in uh, former college, uh, former college roommates. Um, if you're still connected with them, um, you know, go dig deeper into your contacts and uh, and you know, be brave because um, I know it's tough uh, to show vulnerability sometimes. But uh, but be brave enough to dig into the social capital that you have already built uh, within the networks that you have. If you're a parent. Uh, talk to your other, um, talk to your PTO or your PTA members, um, you know, who are working mothers and working parents who are, who are working. Um, you know, church is also a great place to talk to, to talk to folks if, if you're a church goer. Um, hell, I meet, I see people at the park all the time. If you're a dog person and you walk your dog all the time, you know, I mean, there are just so many different ways to connect with people. And if, you, if they're the same people that you see every day, but you just wave hi to, strike up a conversation. You never know what's going to come of it. So I would just say, dig in and build on the social capital that you have currently built. I think people are so, uh, so focused on trying to find new avenues to connect and new avenues to network professionally when they don't realize that even within their personal environments, they could be, they, you know, they may find opportunities that they didn't even know existed. It's, it's so true. I, I would, I would add from my perspective, have a clearly defined target of where you want to go, because this is not a market for wishy-washy or please tell mm -hmm. me what I should do. That's not, this is not the best market for that. It, it's, you really need that clarity. You need to have that targeted direction because an employer wants confidence and they want you to persuade and convince them of what you bring to the table to raise their capabilities. And if you can't deliver that either to recruiters like us or uh, to our clients, you, you won't be moving up the ladder or even to another role. So you've got to go in with a very clear vision. Uh, know yourself, know your abilities, don't oversell. It's not a time to try something new or give me a week, I'll have it down. That's not this market. This is about matching your skills to the right opportunity. That's the right time for you so that you'll thrive and be happy. 
Larry, I'd add on that just one one thing. Sorry, Larry. Um, no, it's okay. The, the having your story or, or having a real view on what it is that you want to do, I think, is fantastic. The way the world is right now, though, things are a little fuzzy, right? And you may get calls or you may get outreach or get connected on a particular opportunity that you say, that's actually, I mean, I've done some of that, but maybe not all of that. Be open-minded. If someone reaches out to you for a conversation, take every conversation, even if you look at the role and say, there's not, not going to be for me. Um, that conversation will probably lead to something else down the road. It also gives you an opportunity to really think about and hone your story. Um, I think those connections are pretty critical um, and having an open mind and being a bit flexible about what might come your way in this kind of a market is, is a good thing. And, and I might add to that. First of all, I can see Anastasia's phrase of social capital is catching fire on the chat here. And <laughs> so, uh, so well done. Uh, I must admit, I, I mean, I have a, I have a big uh, Bernie's mountain dog, Anastasia. I've taken my dog for a walk, but I haven't quite had a career conversation with anyone yet maybe i'm walking the wrong way. <laughs> you just um, never know yeah right. uh, uh maybe i need to change my walking route um <laughs> when you i think the question was you know what should you adjust or think about during your job search right now and i would say look there's things that you can control and things that you can't control unfortunately the things that you can't control in my opinion are actually some of the most important things out there and specifically i mean your reputation how you have behaved and acted in the workplace over the last five, 10, doesn't, have, doesn't matter how old you are, five years in, 10 years in, 20 years in, 30 years in. So the accumulated um, uh, you know, reputation that you have built, how people view you, how you perceive them, how you've treated them, that, that is what goes in your wake. And that is the hardest to change in the short term. And yet that may be the single most important attribute that people think about you, certainly when we do behind the scenes referencing on, on people or have spoken to people who used to work with someone about them. So I would just tell people to bear in mind sort of the accumulated uh, reputational capital um, that you have built up over your career, I think is the single most important thing, and yet it's the hardest to adjust. So that's, that's just one sort of tough fact of life. But the other facts that I think that you can control is everything that Anastasia, Larry, and, and Jennifer spoke about. You know, what is your target strategy? What is your route for getting to use the LinkedIn term? How do you get to your second connections through your first connections? Um, what is your value proposition statement? I've sometimes found, ironically, marketing leaders are not very good at marketing themselves <laughs> or not marketing themselves in a way that is distinct and has meaning to those that they're talking to. I do find sometimes marketers get caught up in marketing language, and that's great to some extent, but does it matter to the business or the individual that you're talking to? So I would just be a little bit thoughtful about how you come across yourself, what you can control and what you can't control at this point in your search. So sort of uh, swinging to a little bit more of a strategic approach and engaging with firms with the uh, you on this panel. Um, what what is the strategy for those seeking senior roles for the executive marketer? Um, what are you what are you looking for? What do you how would you like them to engage with you and their potential uh, employer? Jennifer, do you want to go first? Oh, <laughs> um, look, I um, we're all going to have something to say on this. Um, I think it's a um, it's a very busy market. Just from a candidate perspective, I think there are lots to lots of opportunities out there. We are all reaching out to you on different roles and opportunities. I think um, be as responsive as you can. I think um, you know as we talk to you and we're thinking about what our clients are asking us to look for, right? Um, we're looking for results. We're looking for a track record. We're looking for perspective on the things you've done. Have that story ready. Um, the networking and the relationship building is really important, but really getting a strong sense for what you've been able to do and drive and measure and have an impact on a business. Think about that as part of your narrative and how you can share that. That helps us a great deal. Um, uh, I would I would start there. I think the the you know the other ways in which to just think about engaging with us too. I would say in this current market, be patient. Processes I think Richard mentioned this earlier are taking a while, um, and so you may it may be several weeks before things move forward on a search. Know that things are moving, um, but but be patient, be proactive, but be patient. Um, I sometimes try and start responding to a question like this, Laura, by just trying to dimensionalize what we do and how much of it we do. I think uh, particularly for the executive search firm, sometimes you know, people have asked me, you know, what do I do and how do I explain it? They assume that somehow you know, I'm placing 50 to 100 people a year. And I have to very quickly disabuse them of that notion. 
if I did 20 placements a year, that would be a darn good year. OK, so I want to be clear to people, we're typically not a volume shop. We're probably doing a dozen to 20 placements a year that are high value, high impact. It does mean through that process, we speak to a lot of people, but it only results in a dozen to, to maybe, as I said, 20 would actually be on an exceptional year. Uh, so I just want to make it clear that, that this isn't really a, a volume game. I do encourage people, look, reach out. I mean, the, the, the typical mode of connection these days, for better or for worse, is email. I actually cannot remember the last time anyone actually cold called me. And I don't answer the calls anyway, <laughs> but email is fine. But email is totally fine. And I will legitimately read every email. I, right now, I'll be honest, we're getting a lot of, I imagine everyone on this call is getting a lot of unsolicited emails every day. I can't, we can't speak to everyone. We just can't. I just don't have the hours in the day to respond to every single email. You should also be aware for the executive search firms, we can typically really only help when we're actively retained on a relevant search. What we're not going to do is take your resume, throw it around at a client and hope something sticks. Um, that's not our business model. That's not how we get paid. That's not how we get compensated. We're just not going to do that. So it does mean that, look, you may not hear from us. It doesn't mean that we haven't it doesn't mean that we've forgotten about you. It just means that we don't have a relevant search mandate at this point in time uh, with the right brief. Um, so I'd say, look, don't be shy to reach out. Don't be insulted if, you know, somehow I'm not getting back to you in 30 minutes and giving you a phone call. We, we just can't do it. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't make the connection. I get asked, well, you know, does it matter if it's a, if it's a cold email versus a, a warm, you know, some, uh, some connection making a, uh, the connection? I really don't mind. I, it might help a little bit if it comes from someone I know, but it's not really going to make a, a, a difference. I think we all try to be diligent in being respectful. I think I particularly try and help job seekers where we can. I think, you know, I've always felt there's some reciprocity is an important part of what we do, trying to help people in their moment of need, I hope has some payback uh, further down, further down the road. I'm probably going to get back to people pretty quickly if I'm working on a relevant search, but just because you're not hearing from us doesn't mean that you're being ignored. It just means there's just legitimately not much we can do at that moment in time. I think it's also help, help me help you. I mean, it's part of the benefit of being a professional networker and being a part of AMA is it's the relationships you build. So understanding what's relevant to you as an individual looking for the next step in your career is very helpful, whether that's via email or maybe we schedule a quick 15 minute pre-screen call. But then you, once you're connected to us, you know who we know that you want to know. If there's an opportunity with one of my clients and you are exposing something in this market because it does move very slow, we do create sometimes, not always, sometimes informational interviews where we can create an opportunity with our client partners where the, if the talent's available and they have the time, especially when they're used to paying us for a name, when we send them a name, it does get attention. So um, it's another way to work. But again, am I going to send you on 100 informational interviews? No. Uh, but if it's something that's relevant and it's an important client, absolutely. It is about who you know and it is about timing. So, you know, connected to this, maybe everyone's not finished responding. I just want to weave this in. Connected to this, um, I think, Jennifer, you mentioned earlier, you know, this is not the time to, um, to tout new skills or to try to change your direction. Yet, in some of the chat here, and as we read every day, um, there is you know, new technology and there are new challenges from a marketing perspective that uh, brands and uh, other performance organizations they want their top marketers to tackle. So if you can weave that into your response, um, how focused should they should senior marketers be on leading those new initiatives? I'm, I'll, Lori, I'll start. I, I think I, I think I was saying before that given the fuzziness in the market, I think it is actually important for marketers to try to attain new skills, be connected with new technology. There's lots of conversations around AI and we could, we could spend 10 more panels like this talking about that trend. Um, but I think the expectation is very much today that marketers can wear multiple hats. They've got more than just one functional skill in marketing, right? So an ability to uh, you know, connect deeper into the MarTech stack. Perhaps you're a, a performance and growth marketer and you wanna raise your hand and try to work on something that's more brand oriented, build those skills, especially now if hiring is slower in your sector or your industry, this is a time, frankly, to start to attain some of that work uh, or some of that, that skill set. 
why you're sitting in chair today. I think it's critically important. And I think organizations as budgets are shrinking um, at the moment, organizations are expecting their marketers to be able to be a bit more flexible and nimble in this market. Okay. And so directly connected to that, um, what about those that are in a seat and are looking for growth or their next uh, position, next challenge from a marketing perspective internally? What if, I know you're not hiring that person, you're not placing them, but what advice would you give them? And, and this can be at any level, the most from the most senior to our next gen creatives. Okay, so I'll take a stab at this, uh, uh, Laurie. It comes back to a, a point I was making earlier, which is my actual concern is that I don't think many companies do a tremendous job around succession planning and marketing leadership. Mm -hmm. I worry that marketing is becoming a series of highly specialized sub-disciplines and people are not rotated, not necessarily being even given the, either given the opportunity or pushing themselves or their leaders to rotate them around roles in which they may become increasingly familiar. Because I think the worry is people grow up with a certain stereotype. Oh, you're the you're the you're the creative person. Oh, you're the you're the integrated marketing person. Oh, you're the marketing operations person. Oh, you're the performance. I do worry that there are labels now being attached to people as they grow up through their career. And they may just stumble into this without realizing it. And before they know it, they're mid-career and suddenly they realize they've been pigeonholed in a certain area. I do think it relies on being in a company of a certain size and scale that provides rotational or development opportunities. Not all companies are great at it, to be honest, but I do think it's incumbent on yourselves to try and push for those development opportunities and put yourself in areas where you are not comfortable. I think it's easier to do earlier in your career, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, it's perceived as less, quote unquote, risky to your employer to do it. But I think if you don't do it, there is a risk of, of being pigeonholing because I, as I said, I, I don't, I worry about succession planning and marketing leadership. Mm -hmm. That's why there's so many, that's why we're in business because so many marketing leaders have to be hired from the outside. That's why we exist. I hate to say it, maybe I'm putting myself out of the job here, but um, th there's a real challenge. And, and if I may add to that, you know, Richard is, um, if you are in an organization and have any influence at all, even hiring at mid-level, um, be that marketer that's make, that makes that change internally. It's part of, you know, what we should be doing to drive our organizations um, from a marketing development perspective. But, Anyone else have a comment on that? I would say, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I would say be selfish. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> Either one of you. you guys you, do get out. <laughs> all good. All good. Um, I think be selfish. You you need to, you know yourself better than anyone else. And you know what your passions and your desires are. Pay attention to what's going on in your community. And, and honestly, be selective of what you do. I don't, I'm not a big believer in today's market maybe in the 80s and 90s, you evolved and you grew within the organization, but you may grow upward, but you may also need to grow out to another place, whether it be your own or another organization. So be a little selfish in that approach. Uh, I think experiential marketing is a, with augmented reality and AI is a fascinating area. So for marketers out there, if you're not really seeking more beyond the the basic brand messaging and analytics look for what what's new what's cool what's fun um and really become the expert to your point Lori. do it yourself bring it in inside do a special project see how it affects your brand if you happen to be a brand marketer but be a little selfish that's that's what i would say is, is set your own course don't wait for the course to come to you I agree. I completely agree with Larry. We've seen uh, a lot of our members uh, sharpening their skills in terms of digital marketing. Um, uh, Wharton has a great class. I know Northwestern also has some some uh, great uh, class for executive uh, course for executives um, that uh, that just want to sharpen their skills and stay fresh with the new with the, you know with all the new changes in the market. So even though they are digital marketers and that is part of part of their toolkit, they want to make sure their skills are fresh and sharp for, um, for what's coming. So, uh, so I would say, look into those, um, you know, uh, their, their webinars. I know LinkedIn has some fantastic, um, some fantastic, uh, learning, uh, learning, uh, uh, abilities on there. So uh, I completely agree with Larry, be selfish, um, you know, up your game, every chance you get. Thank you for ex excellent insights and very actionable. Um, so as we wrap up here today, I just wanted to ask a few little um, 
uh, housekeeping tactical questions with regard that we've come up come up in the chat and then also that we uh, thought about earlier too um, related to the toolkit. Um, besides LinkedIn, where else uh, should folks be focusing in their uh, their search? On think other than what we've talked about already, and someone specifically asked about the you know job seeker button in LinkedIn plus or minus. Just what are your thoughts about using uh, tools and uh, the communication channels in the job search? Um, I'll take oh. this. Um, okay, I see that. I, I, sorry, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, I I I'd say you know connect connect like uh, connect connect connect. So, you know, so you use the social capital build social capital. Um, there are so many different organizations for, uh, for across all across the board uh, for executive of executives of color and, and people of color specifically, Council of Urban Professionals is a really good one. Um, the A-List is also uh, another one. Um, there's Becca, there's the uh, Association for Latino Professionals for America. There's so many great organizations that people don't think of. I mean, your Chamber of Commerce, your local, your local Chamber of Commerce, and national, there's so many uh, various avenues. So I would just say, you know, just reach out to those organizations. And again, it's about building on social capital that you don't even that you haven't even used. You know, you if if you belong to various organizations like that, reach out to some of the members. Help reach out to the board. If, there, if, if, if that organization has a board, reach out to some of the board members, see if you can, you know, just ha ask them for five minutes. It doesn't have to be a 30 minute conversation, ask them for five minutes and that will lead to another conversation usually um, because people get busy and, and I'm sure they get requests all the time. But if you ask somebody for five minutes, most people can make five minutes happen for them. So, um, so I'd say just, just think think about the different organizations that you currently belong to and uh, and think about joining some more. A lot of them are free. Some of them have nominal costs. Some of them are a little more expensive, but um, but definitely worth it. And you can write it off on your taxes. Yeah. All options should be on the table. Don't, don't exclude anything until you find that it's not fruitful. If you're looking through one path and it, it gives you garbage and things that aren't relevant, then stop using that. But it, it is the connections. It is the network. But but go for it, for everything. AMA is a great source. Sometimes we think and only operate within our own club. Look at other markets. You can get great advice and suggestions or, or mirror what you see. Houston has a great AMA. Uh, Chicago. I mean, there are other markets outside of your local market where you can really connect with professionals, learn from them, fine tune and tweak. Take the cheat sheet. I mean, I'm all about the quickest course to get there. <laughs> and so speaking of cheat, cheat sheets, AI generated resumes, cover letters, responses, um, how are those? Talk to us a little bit about how, what's going on there. Uh, cautions, do's and don'ts. We hear, we're hearing a lot about this related to um, the academic world. What about job seeking? Yeah, I, I don't read cover letters. I'll just start there. I've been doing this a long time and it, it usually is generic and not to the point of what I need to know. So I prefer to speak to an individual first um, and resumes should, from my perspective, show your entire career path and your history because that gives me a sense of who you are, where you've been. Uh, and then once we talk, then I do have an individual, if there's a role we're talking about, give me a follow-up with a couple of questions about why they're interested, why they'd be a fit. It makes the most efficient use of their time and mine. But for me, cover letters, I, I just, they usually aren't even part of the filtering process. I push them aside because I want to find out from the individual directly what matters to them right now. I think I, I agree. Oh, go ahead, Jennifer, sorry. The tools that you use to market yourself are incredibly important, right? And so your resume or your LinkedIn profile, frankly, are the two places that, that an executive recruiter is probably gonna go first. So having the right amount of data and information and perspective on what you've done in your career, really focus on outcomes, focus on data, focus where you've been able to drive results, um, I think is, is incredibly, incredibly helpful. I, I haven't seen a cover letter on a resume in years, and that's that's fine. I think we get right to the right to the nitty gritty and really want to understand what it is that you've done and how you've impacted the organizations in which you've been. So it's it's critical. 
I, I completely agree. Do not, do not, do not write a cover letter. I, um, I the, just last week, it's funny that this question is happening because just last week I had a request from our members uh, and how, how do you, how do you, you know, have you, have you written a cover letter? How do you write a cover letter? And because they couldn't believe that somebody was asking them for a cover letter uh, for, for a role they were, they were seeking. So, uh, so yeah, don't No, uh, most recruiters um, are not interested in that. And even most, most AHR people, it's too much paper. No, it's too. It's one additional thing to have to do, and and they're not interested in it. I would say do this if you don't have, if you don't feel confident in writing your resume, hire a, a resume writer uh, and it, or an executive coach. Um, it is. I know for me, earlier in my career, it was the one of the best investments I ever made. Um, especially if you don't have the time to write it yourself, um, and uh, and you can you know you can hire a, a, re a professional resume writer or an executive coach to to uh, help you with it. Um, it's an it's an incredible investment. And when you see and and it's also a really great confidence booster because when you look at your resume when it's done and you're like oh my god I did all of that like I only told you uh, you know I worked here so it just it it's a great confidence booster as well and can help power you uh, forward in your search. Um, and I'll just make one final point and try and tie it back to the AI point you were making, Laurie. Look, agree everything about cover letters. Here's what is sometimes helpful, though, a bio, a biography. I do sometimes see, particularly for senior leaders, a three or four paragraph, not page, to be very clear, just a short bio about themselves. Here's why I find resumes are essentially uh, chronological bullet points. They don't do a very good job of telling stories or linking together a narrative arc of someone's career, and a bio can do that. Now, I will be interested, Laurie, to see if you can tell, G tell chat GPT, look at my resume and write three paragraphs about what I do really well. Now, I'd be actually very curious to see whether um, chat GPT can produce a compelling bio from a resume and pull all those threads that I spoke about and try and create that narrative arc. I would legitimately be interested to see if that works and how compelling that is. Sounds great. Well, in the interest and respect for everybody's time, we're going to wrap today. I want to thank each and every one of you, our panelists, Richard, Anastasia, Jennifer, and Larry returning for the fourth or fifth time. Larry, really appreciate your support. Uh, what a great conversation today. I think there are so many um, threads and you know tangents that really are worth a uh, deeper dive. I will talk to our illustrious uh, Rasika Narang that um, really put all of this together uh, behind this, the scenes about uh, planning future events. She's already working on a workplace. This is the first in a workplace series uh, that will continue. The next is on June 8th, and the title is Thriving in a Modern, as a Modern Marketer in the Mar Modern Workplace. So we'll do a deeper dive for those of us who, you know, perhaps are in a role, uh, what should we be thinking about, and even and talk about some of the things that we touched on today at a, at a deeper level. So please look out for a notification and an invite for that. Uh, check out all the other things at AMA New York and AMA, and as someone mentioned, other uh, chapters of uh, a, the American Marketing Association are doing. Again, thank you for your time. We hope to see you in person at another event, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you.